Ah, you're on the grass, looking up at the blue sky, enjoying some singing birds and catching some rays. You watch different shaped clouds soaring slowly, high up in the air. Suddenly, you hear a powerful loud rumble coming from far away. You get up and notice a gigantic thick cloud ahead. But it's not the size that scares you, it's the shape. The cloud looks like a skull. Eh, don't worry, it doesn't mean anything bad's gonna happen. Anyway, it's not even a cloud. A few years ago, a skull formed out of thick smoke over Mount Vesuvius in Italy. That's the same volcano that erased the ancient city of Pompeii from the face of the Earth. Of course, back then, many people were afraid that the volcano would erupt again. Luckily for everyone, the volcano's still in a deep sleep. It was just a nearby forest fire that caused the famous skull cloud. But the locals weren't so sure. Some thought that the fire and the skull were set on purpose. Eh, wouldn't be the first time. Centralia, Pennsylvania. Population, well, just look around. Looks a little scary. Bare trees, no animals, no people. All the buildings are empty. Roads are all cracked and strewn with gravel. No cars, obviously. Thick smoke everywhere. This town's been burning for more than 50 years. Centralia used to be a mining town. One of its coal mines was abandoned, and locals used it as a dump for their trash. Then, according to most people, the city decided to get rid of the trash in the usual way, by burning it. The plan was a major failure. Hmm, let's see what could have possibly gone wrong here. The trash fire got deep into the mine's tunnels, ignited the coal that's still down there, and has been burning steadily ever since. The level of carbon dioxide shot up, and they had to shut down the other mines nearby for safety. No one could stop the fire, and the underground flames spread beneath the city. Roads began to warm up, the soil went sour, and the streets slowly filled with smoke and smog. In 2017, there were only five people living there. Welcome to Abraham Lake in Canada. It's completely frozen. You step onto the transparent ice and look down at what lies beneath. No fish, just some mysterious frozen bubbles. They look like small clouds frozen in ice, or jellyfish who forgot to pack a winter jacket. There are thousands of these little bubbles made up of methane. But don't try to dig a hole in the ice to touch it. Methane is highly flammable. It's created by methane-producing bacteria that eats leaves, grass, insects, and any other organic stuff that gets into the lake. When the methane touches the frozen water, it turns into tens of thousands of frozen little balls. When the ice melts, they burst open and sizzle. If you lit a match over them at just the right moment, the lake would look kind of like an erupting volcano. Similar lakes can be found near some shores of the Arctic Ocean. There, the size of the bubbles can reach several times the size of hot air balloons. Beautiful for sure, but not exactly safe. The next shocking lake is in Indonesia, on the island of Java. You come to a majestic volcano overgrown with grass and trees. The volcano seems to be asleep, but smoke is pouring out of it. You, of course, climb to the summit. Exhausted, tired, sweaty, you're ready to cool off. Nice work, you made it to the top. You look into the mouth of the volcano. Hmm, no boiling lava, just a beautiful, bright, turquoise lake down there. It looks like an oasis. Perfect time for a refreshing dip. You run down and get ready to jump in. But that's not water, that's acid. Sulfurous gases get into the lake from under the volcano. The lake itself is full of metals. When the gases touch them, they form that beautiful turquoise water, I mean acid. Better head back to the nearest village, rest and come back at night when it's cooler. In the dark, the lake seems to grow. Right above it, you see light-filled exploding little clouds. The sulfurous gases rise out of the lake, combine with the air, and flash bright blue. Still, don't get too close. Up in the sky, underground, volcanoes, lakes? Hmm. Time to head out to sea. You get on a yacht and sail off. It doesn't matter where, this next one happens all over the world. So, the sea is crystal clear and calm, there's no wind in your sails. Everything is so peaceful… wait, what's that? You hear a loud, loud noise. 
Two seconds later, a huge wave, way taller than your mast, rises from the calm sea and hits your yacht. The ship manages to stay upright, and the huge wave disappears. You just survived the attack of a rogue wave. Some scientists think it happens when the surface sea current smashes into a strong headwind. Others say it happens when warm and cold currents come up against each other. Another popular theory is wave interference, where small waves team up to form one monster one. Under certain conditions, waves get a sort of superpower. Out of all the waves in the area, that'll be one which sucks the energy out of all the others. When it's full, the wave spits it all out. Maybe that's why the wave's so strong, but only lasts an instant. What about clouds? Scary? Well, they can be, if they're huge thunderclouds, walls of gray and black blocking out the sun, the moon, and the stars. First, you're relaxing in your backyard, then you see thunderclouds. Then you get thunderstorms, hail, floods, and even tornadoes. They're easy to spot thanks to their epic appearance. Thick, heavy, and dark. They can even sparkle inside because of lightning. That's one scary-looking cloud. But before you run away, let's see how it forms. Clouds are like roller coasters. Imagine you're a small drop of water, hanging out with your friends in the ocean, waiting in line for the brand new ride that just opened up. It's time! You strap in. Nothing happens. Then you feel it. The roller coaster starts to go up, up, up! You can see all your droplet friends down there. They're so small. You keep rising, just waiting for the big whoosh. But nothing happens. Then you're so high up that you're in the clouds. It's not so scary up here, and there are loads of your friends. <laughs> nice. It's starting to get cold. You look around. It's happening to everyone. You're being turned into beautiful ice crystals. So shiny and pretty. The clouds filling up getting kind of cramped with all those other water droplets. Still, what a peaceful, enjoyable… wow! The ride kicks back in and you start to freefall. Slowly at first, then faster and faster, thousands of your fellow drops falling back to Earth, some holding on tight to the handrail, some laughing and waving their hands in the air. Woohoo! And splash! Still, I like the lightning ride better. That's one where they strap you in, you ride up, and then you play bumper cars way up in the clouds. The more times you bump into another water droplet, the more lightning you create. Now, not all lightning happens inside clouds. There's a rare phenomenon called a dirty thunderstorm. The lightning happens above a volcano, the most famous is in Japan. It erupts almost every day and spits black clouds high into the air. So, it's super scary volcano clouds, plus lightning. Regular lightning happens during a storm when ice crystals bump into each other. In a dirty thunderstorm, bits of volcanic ash collide, create friction, and spark up the sky. Okay, better finish the journey with something safe and beautiful. No more cloud roller coasters, please. You're in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, one of the driest places on Earth. But this desert has a beautiful secret. Every three to five years, flowers pop up out of nowhere. It's so famous, it's also called the flowering desert. Seeds lie around in the ground, just waiting for some rain. When the desert gets enough water, about 200 types of flowers sprout up. The yellow sands of the Atacama turn purple, white, green, and pink. Let's face it, as stars go, our sun is actually, well, pretty boring. Come on, there's nothing unusual about it. There are millions of similar yellow dwarfs in the universe. And yet, we love it. After all, it's the only star we have, and it gives us life. However, it wasn't always like that. Once upon a time, the sun had a twin, possibly an evil one. Hmm, what happened to it? Well, let's find out. Now this here is a giant molecular cloud. They're also sometimes called dark nebula. Here, there are many interstellar clumps full of gas, dust, and piles of stars. These clouds have no clear boundaries and often take weird, crazy forms. You can even see some of them with the naked eye. Look at the clear sky at night. They look like dark spots all across the bright Milky Way. And this is exactly where our sun was born about 4.5 billion years ago. The sun originated from one of these molecular clouds. 
billions of years ago, waves of energy were passing by here. They collected all this material and compressed these clumps into dense nuclei. That's when a protostar was born. This young protostar was a ball of lukewarm hydrogen and helium. And then, millions of years later, the temperature and pressure inside the balls increased. As a result, a star was born. The Sun. But not everything in this molecular cloud has turned into the Sun. The remaining materials began to revolve around the new star. And, as you might have guessed, they gradually turned into planets, including our Earth. This is how our solar system was created. But it's quite possible that this is not the whole story, and that at the same time, along with our star, another one was born. The lost twin of the Sun, made from the same materials under the same conditions. But why do we think that it exists? Well, recently, scientists have launched some statistical models to find out more about the birth of stars. And these models have shown that many stars appear not individually, but in clusters, or at least with one sibling. After more research, scientists confirm that, yep, most stars formed inside molecular clouds are born with a companion. Sometimes these companions stay together. For example, a small star will revolve around a large one. They can even form double, triple, and other star systems. And sometimes, their paths may diverge forever. This probably happened to our Sun as well. It could have had a sibling too. Perhaps not even one, but a whole cluster of little brothers and sisters. And one bigger twin with a similar mass and other characteristics. But if that's the case, then where are you, our lost twin? Well, we have one hypothesis, and according to it, this twin may not be as good as it seems. In the 1980s, scientists began to notice a certain pattern in the Earth's history. Approximately every 27 million years, give or take, large-scale extinctions occurred on our planet. Pretty strange, right? Every 27 million years in the history of Earth, some kind of catastrophe occurred that changed its biosphere forever, as if something, as scheduled, cyclically, caused them. Then an astronomer, Richard Muller, suggested that there may be something that caused the events, a certain celestial body. According to him, it could be a dwarf star that we can't see because of how dim it is. It could be located about one and a half light years away from us. This star rotates around the Sun in a huge orbit, and it approximately takes a whopping 27 million years for it to finish its orbit. And when it gets closest to the Sun, it starts to cause complete chaos. While approaching us, this troublemaker changes the trajectories of comets in the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt. As a result, all these comets start to rush straight toward us. Then they crash into the Earth and cause mass extinctions, just like it was with dinosaurs. This hypothetical star was named Nemesis. It's the name of the ancient Greek deity of retribution. What is it taking revenge on us for? No idea. Perhaps it didn't like the fact that, once upon a time, the Sun took away almost all the dust and gas from a molecular cloud. The Sun became a fairly large star, but the twin remained dark and small. Moreover, in the end, it was forced to fly away in the middle of nowhere. Anyone would be annoyed by something like this. Scientists have put forward various hypotheses about what the mysterious nemesis is. Perhaps it's a brown or red dwarf. The remnants of a star that has completely depleted its fuel. Or maybe it's not a star at all, but a rogue planet more gigantic than Jupiter. Well, whatever it is, its existence isn't particularly pleasant for us. However, all our attempts to find the culprit unfortunately fail. At the moment, we still haven't found any signs of Nemesis. Recent studies have called into question the theory of regular mass extinctions. If you look more into fossil records, you'll notice that these catastrophes occurred rather randomly, rather than on a clear schedule. Now scientists doubt if Nemesis may actually exist. They also say that any star moving in a similar orbit would be very unstable, and it's very unlikely that it could have survived for that long. But despite the lack of clear evidence, Nemesis had become quite famous online. Many articles and news still mention it in different contexts. They like to write off any dramatic events taking place in the world, like asteroid falls, tsunamis, and so on, on this mysterious star. So now, all this may seem like a typical urban legend. 
But let's not forget about something important. Even if Nemesis itself doesn't exist, it doesn't mean that the Sun didn't have a twin. First of all, everything we talked about at the beginning is still relevant. Most stars aren't born alone. The probability that our Sun also had a sibling is still very high. Secondly, there may be evidence of the existence of this lost twin, and is probably somewhere in the Oort cloud. This is a huge cloud in the outer limits of our solar system. It consists of a bunch of comets and other cool rocks. Now, scientists believe that this cloud stores various remnants and fragments of everything that remained after the birth of our solar system. It's like a huge museum of our past. So, in this Oort cloud, scientists have noticed something interesting. Basically, this region seems to be too heavy. What the Oort cloud actually looks like doesn't correspond to our current models of the formation of the solar system. It's too heavy because there are some remnants of something in it. So there used to be something in the solar system that we don't know about yet. But when scientists included a possible second sun in their calculations, it fit just right. Like a missing piece of a puzzle, the lost twin perfectly matches the gap in the weight of the Oort cloud. So yeah, the sun almost certainly had a twin. But what happened to it? And where is it now? Unfortunately, this star is most likely already very far away. Probably after their birth, the son and daughter, <laughs> okay, son 2.0, spent only a couple of million years together, and then they had to separate completely. Now, this second twin may be hundreds of light years away from us. It can be anywhere in the Milky Way. And yeah, theoretically, we could find it, but that would be quite difficult. To do this, we need to find all the stars similar to our Sun, about the same age, all over the Milky Way galaxy. And even if we make a list of these stars, what's next? We have no way of knowing which one was really the twin of the Sun. So the lost twin will most likely remain lost, and our Sun will remain forever lonely. Ah, oh, what a sad story. But cheer up, for us it's probably the best. If we had two suns, perhaps the solar system would never have become what it is now. Our planet might not exist at all, and that means that there might be no life. So we probably should be grateful for the sun's sacrifice. On the other hand, our sunsets would look like the ones they have on Tatooine. Cool. Let's head to the Middle East. There's a large desert here, and it's completely dark, except for one spot. It's a big circle that glows with a bright orange light. The Darvaza Crater. And it's just a giant gas burner. Years ago, geologists found gas here, and they started mining for it. But when they excavated, they came across a void underground. The void collapsed, and it formed a crater. It's as wide as half a soccer field, and as deep as a five-story building. Gas began to come out of the cracks in the crater. And since animals were often grazing near this place, the geologists decided to set these gas streams on fire to exhaust the source. Geologists thought the fire would be over in a day or two. But if you come here now, you'll see this gateway to the underworld is still burning. And it's been going on for almost 50 years. In 2013, a man descended to the bottom of the burning crater for the first time. He collected many different samples there, and scientists were able to find bacteria that aren't found anywhere else on Earth. They're quite comfortable at the bottom of this endless burning frying pan. In 2009, a man in L'Aquila, Italy, saw flickering lights dancing above the stone street. He immediately knew what to do and moved his family to a safer place. Only seconds later, a massive 8.3 magnitude earthquake hit the whole region. His knowledge of the strange lights saved his and his family's lives. So what are those mysterious warnings? For centuries, people interpreted the lights as something otherworldly. The scientific community didn't take them seriously, just put them down to a false recollection, a mind trick, or pure imagination. With the introduction of surveillance cameras and smartphones, the amount of evidence grew enormously. Now the connection was obvious. Lights appear and an earthquake hits. So, experts finally started taking it seriously and started digging for the truth. But after years of research, 
To this day, geologists are still not fully sure what the source of the lights is, but they have recognized five types of them. Bright flashes that light up the sky, looking like storm lightning or a strong camera flash. Rays in the sky that can look like light columns. Different sized flames that come through the ground. Diffused glows over the mountains. And slow moving balls of light that can be misinterpreted as ball lightning. Another equally little understood atmospheric phenomenon. These are literal balls of lightning that can float and explode, leaving a sulfuric odor behind. But unlike ball lightning, these spherical EQLs seem to be harmless, if you don't count what's coming afterward. But with all these types of lights, experts can't know how exactly they're connected to earthquakes. They don't only show up before one hits. Some have been reported during and after earthquakes. They can also appear with other phenomena, like meteorite crashes, volcanic eruptions, or auroras. For now, scientists can only come up with theories to explain the unexplainable. One of the recent ones claimed the lights were electric lines being broken during an earthquake. But this theory doesn't explain how the phenomena was observed hundreds or even thousands of years ago. Like the ancient Chinese tale of dragon-looking clouds appearing in the sky as a warning of an upcoming quake. Or how an ancient Roman historian reported huge flame-like lights bursting out just before a huge earthquake occurred. The electric line theory was quickly dismissed. Another theory suggested it was escaping gas. During an earthquake, the underground rocks expand and shrink under pressure and heat. This opens and closes small spaces between them. Different gases make their way through these new openings. Radon, for example, can get released during seismic activity. It can ionize the air, making it electrically charged. But radon doesn't do it enough to create bright sparks of light. This theory is close, but doesn't quite hit the mark. One of the most accepted theories is that it might be from electricity traveling up from underground. When underground igneous rocks, ones that form from magma deep within the Earth, are under stress, they release ionized, or electrically charged, oxygen. It travels through the surface and up into the atmosphere, where it creates a localized electric field. That can produce brief flashes of visible light. Some aren't even that quick and can go on for minutes at a time. So there you are. You've been driving for hours through the night. You didn't have any chance to sleep, so your mind is hanging by a thread. You stop the car and go out to stretch your limbs. And then you look up into the sky and see a beautiful sunrise. Whoa, wait, there are three suns in the sky. You rub your eyes, but nope, there are still three bright stars in the sky. No, our home star hasn't been torn into three pieces, nor has it been visited by two other stars. This is called a sun dog. It occurs mostly during severe frosts. Small ice crystals in the sky bend the light. As a result, you may see three bright spots in the sky instead of just one. This phenomenon is officially called a halo. Usually, it's just a circle around the sun. You can even see a halo at night, too. Just look at a street lamp, and you'll see a bright circle around it. Sometimes, a halo can take on a fancier shape. If there's a lot of ice in the air, the light is warped even more. Just like in a room with a dozen mirrors. Then, the halo can take on the shape of a human eye. Because of this phenomenon, a false dawn can occur too. While you're looking at the horizon, the dawn begins, and the edge of the sun appears. A little bit more, and wait, the sun starts to just dissolve in the sky. After a few moments, it's dark again. And only a minute later, the real sun shows its face. It was the same light curvature effect you saw before with the three suns. Only now, the light is curved vertically, not horizontally. And instead of the real sun, its reflection in ice crystals in the sky appeared. And now moving on. This cloud looks like a dinosaur, and this one looks like a cat. And this, whoa, it looks like these clouds are falling down. Oh, phew, that's just a mammatus cloud. Their shape really makes them look like chunks of cloud about to slam on the ground. 
Well, that's not going to happen, but you better start seeking cover anyway. Such clouds are a sign of a severe thunderstorm coming. It takes a lot of moist air with ice crystals at the top and dry air at the bottom to create such clouds. Then, vertical currents of air appear between these layers. And these currents make the clouds take the shape of a human brain. <laughs> and this giant cloud looks like a dome that's going to cover an entire city. In fact, that's exactly what happens. A huge cloud covers a large area and then rains heavily on it. Sometimes, the front of such a cloud takes a bizarre shape, like in these pictures. It looks more like several giant spaghetti clouds, or even giant cloud worms. This phenomenon can often be seen in Australia, and it's called morning glory. It happens because a strong wind twists part of the cloud on both sides, and then the huge sheet of air dough splits into thick strips. And sometimes, you can see clouds in the sky made of birds. Wow, that cloud moves quickly and changes shape. It becomes more transparent, but then denser and darker again. The birds seem to be involved in some kind of dance or performance. But they're not doing it for beauty or for the crowds of spectators gathered below. They're doing it for protection. When birds group themselves into such a cloud, they intimidate birds of prey. An eagle or hawk would have a hard time picking out a single target among the endless number of birds. And they move quickly, covering each other. Fish are huddled together in schools in the same way. Such a cloud might just spook a hungry predator. Grab some sunglasses and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts around 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. Nature sends early signs of disasters in many different ways. J-shaped trees might mean there's a landslide coming. Since the ground is moving slowly, the trees grow into this super selfieable shape. Try to find a flat area and avoid going near any trees unless you have superhuman strength. Another mystical phenomenon can be seen in the desert, a sand waterfall. When the wind brings a lot of sand to the edge of the canyon, it begins to fall down. Now amplify this effect 100 times and you get a sand waterfall in Saudi Arabia. It's really like Niagara Falls, only there's not a drop of water. The locals say this phenomenon warns of an impending sandstorm. It all started with a minor change on our planet. At first, people noticed the moon had become brighter and a little bigger. But nobody paid attention to this. The moon affected tides all over the world. The water flooded the beaches, but it wasn't a tragedy. A lot of fish came close to the shores. People found giant squid, anglerfish, and other creatures next to the coast, although they usually live in the dark depths. New, stranger things happen every day. Birds no longer fly to the south in winter. They gather in huge groups flying around cities with no purpose. The moon used to help them navigate in nature, so they can't figure out which way to fly anymore. In the boundless waters of the world's oceans, ship captains notice that compasses are now unstable. The arrow is pointing in different directions since the Earth's magnetic poles have changed. People realize the moon has started to approach Earth for an unknown reason. The moon's gravity affects the gravity of our planet. This entails changes in the climate, the behavior of all living beings, and the magnetic field. Now, it rains in the driest places and gets hot in the coldest lands. It's knocking down ecosystems all over the planet. People living near forests hear wolves howling all the time. The moon drives these animals mad. The Earth's natural satellite is growing in size and lights up the night much brighter. Nothing critical has happened yet. People don't panic because they don't want to believe the end is coming. But then, one day, the moon reaches a critical point. You're walking down the street listening to music, and at that moment, someone pushes you. Okay, maybe that guy is late for work. You keep walking, and a girl coming by hits your shoulder. I'm sorry, she says, and goes away. You've noticed the fear in her eyes. You look ahead and see people running towards you. You take off your headphones and hear screams and sirens. 
People leave their cars and run away. Hundreds of seagulls are flying in the sky. You hear a strange noise among all the sounds of chaos. It seems to be water. How is this possible? You're in the city center, a few miles from the shore. But there's no time to think. You notice a huge wave flooding the streets and heading straight to you. You run into a building and go up to the 10th floor. From here, you're watching the water filling the city. The strong stream blows all cars, one-story buildings, and trees off the road. You notice a shark and other fish in the water. People are hiding in houses and on the roofs. The whole city is quickly plunging into a catastrophe. The TV is working in the building where you're hiding. You learn that floods are occurring all over the world. Massive tsunamis cover coastal cities. In some places, waves reach the height of a 30-story building. Many towns have been washed off the face of the Earth. The moon is too close to Earth, and massive floods are just the beginning. The moon flies around Earth and helps to keep our home on its axis. The moon provides climate stability and helps living organisms develop. But now, this balance is broken. The moon is approaching and changing our planet's gravity. Earth can tilt slightly to the side and provoke massive floods around the world. Imagine that you're holding a round glass of water. Tilt it a little. See how the liquid moves from one side to another? The same thing is happening now with the oceans. But the moon is not just approaching us. It's flying around the planet and getting closer with each circle. It causes natural disasters in different locations on Earth all the time. Now the ocean floods one side, and a few hours later, another. So you see all the water going back from the streets to the shore. The oceans may return to the city again by the end of the day. Wait a minute. It seems the end of the day has already come. You notice that the sky has become dark. It's weird, because it's only 3 p.m. The moon changes Earth's rotation speed and makes the day go faster. The moon covers almost the entire sky and brightly illuminates our planet. You see huge lunar craters. It's so close that you can still see it even when the sun shines. In some places, the passing moon obscures the sun. The water is leaving the streets and everyone goes outside. At this moment, an earthquake begins. The road is cracking and the houses are collapsing. There are landslides on the street. Tectonic plates are shifting all over the planet. Imagine two magnetic balls that are approaching each other. So, one ball is the moon and the second one is Earth's core. What do you think will happen to what's above the core? That's hundreds of thousands of miles of the Earth's crust. And now, it's all moving. Destructive cracks are emerging all over the world. The planet's highest mountains break down and turn into a pile of stones. The seabed cracks and releases magma from the underground depths. Volcanoes wake up and erupt magma. Clouds of volcanic ash cover the sky from the sun and the glowing moon. But the scariest thing is still ahead. A collision is inevitable. The moon flies around the planet like a ball in a round glass with a hole in the center. This force drives clouds all over the planet. Now there's a thunderstorm, but in five minutes, it will be snowing. Then the night comes and it starts raining. Water droplets consist of mud and volcanic ash. It's difficult for people to breathe without gas masks. Atmospheric pressure is constantly changing. Some people experience severe migraines and some have sore joints. But there's no time to think about your health. Humanity needs to figure out how to save itself from the collision. A new gravitational order will come when the moon crashes into Earth. Continents will change their shape. They will combine into one giant piece of land or split into a hundred smaller ones. The energy of the collision can burn all the oxygen in the atmosphere and make the planet unsuitable for life. Hiding underground also makes no sense because of deep earthquakes people decide to spend their last hours with loved ones and their families. The moon is getting closer. It's now at the same distance as the International Space Station. The moon covers the sky. Many cities are in the shadows because of the waves. Tsunamis, several miles in height, crash down on the ground. Millions of tons of magma collide with the ocean. Billions of gallons of water just evaporate. 
moisture rises into the air, mixes with ash, and floods the land in the form of giant cumulus clouds. You've accepted the complete destruction of the planet. But something strange happens to the moon at this moment. You notice giant cracks appear on it. The moon slowly begins to divide into two parts. Both halves crumble into hundreds of large pieces. It's just falling apart. The Earth doesn't have a natural satellite anymore. It's just a pile of giant space rocks. But why is this happening? There's a space around our planet called the Roche Limit. In this place, the gravity of Earth is stronger than that of the Moon. This means that the forces holding the Moon together are weaker than those that tear it apart. People are cheering. The Roche Limit has saved the planet. The Moon won't hit us. It breaks up into millions of fragments and forms a circle around our globe. Now, Earth looks like Saturn. A belt of moonstones surrounds us. Huge chunks destroy everything in their path. All the space debris. The satellites are no longer working. Humanity loses its means of communication and navigation. People will have to use paper maps again. The moon held our planet's orbit at a certain angle before these events. Now the axis is tilted differently. One hemisphere becomes closer to the sun, and the other plunges into shadow. The North Pole and the Arctic may turn into hot deserts, and the equator of the planet may be covered with ice. Winter and summer can last for years. The moon's remnants fly around Earth, but some of them fall on our planet. Lunar meteor showers destroy cities and create giant craters. All these events lead to the massive destruction of life on Earth. It will take hundreds of thousands of years to adapt to the new world. We've heard stories about people surviving in the desert, Amazon forest, and uninhabited islands for weeks. Such stories show how tough and resilient people can be. But among these many cases, there is one that can really amaze you. It's the story about a guy who spent three days inside a sunken ship at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. He didn't have oxygen tanks, electricity, communications, or food, but he survived. So it all happened in 2013 on a tugboat that was moving through the Atlantic waters along the coast of Nigeria. That day, early in the morning, there was a small storm. The tug was pulling a vessel with oil tanks. Then, all of a sudden, a huge wave formed. It crashed into the ship and broke the cable. At 4.30 a.m., the tugboat turned upside down. Its entire deck was underwater, and the ship's hull stuck out from the surface. The boat began to sink slowly. The crew of 12 people were trapped, as they all were in their locked rooms. They had closed the doors in their cabins as a precaution, since there were many pirates in those waters. Because of the locked rooms, they couldn't get out. But one of them, cook Harrison Okina, was in the bathroom during this time. The bathroom turned over. Harrison fell on the ceiling. All the clothes and toilet shelves fell on his head. He was stunned and didn't understand what was happening. When he heard the screams of the other crew members, he realized that the ship was sinking. Harrison struggled to his feet. Holding onto the walls, he slowly went out of the cabin. The water level rose above his head. Harrison took a deep breath. He intuitively, driven by fear, reached the engineering room. There was a small pocket with air. This space wasn't wholly flooded, since the water didn't get there and the air hadn't come out. Harrison realized that this was the safest place for him at that moment. He had no fresh water and no food. He was in a cold, damp room. The floor was flooded, and Harrison's feet began to freeze. There was almost no chance of survival. The man found a soda bottle inside the room and a life jacket with two flashlights attached to it. By this time, the ship had descended to the bottom of the ocean at a depth of 100 feet. This is about the height of a 10-story building. The ship's hull was squeezed and made a grinding noise due to the pressure of the water. Then, Harrison heard a strange movement outside the door. It was sharks and other fish that were investigating the deck. At this point, Harrison began to lose hope. Lack of food supplies and pressure weren't the main problems. The air pocket was small, which meant there was little oxygen. Every 24 hours, an average person consumes about 350 cubic feet of air. 
which means Harrison had less than one day left to breathe. But despite this, he lived in such conditions for about 60 hours. This happened thanks to the water. The pressure around the ship was so intense that it compressed the air by about four times. Another problem was the cook's breathing. When we inhale, we absorb oxygen. When we exhale, we release carbon dioxide. This substance is dangerous to your health if its concentration in the air is 5%. Harrison slowly filled the room with carbon dioxide, and he couldn't get out. With each hour, it became harder to breathe. But here again, he was lucky. Water absorbs carbon dioxide, and Harrison moved and splashed it in different directions. Thus, unknowingly, he increased the water area and kept the carbon dioxide level below critical. But even here, his dangers were not over. Hypothermia may occur in a dark, cold room. It's a condition when your body temperature drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. You get cold, and your perception of the world gets distorted. You don't understand where you are and what's going on. You may lose your memory and even experience terminal burrowing. This weird behavior occurs during hypothermia when a person tries to find a small shelter, even if they're in a closed room. They can even start digging the cold floor with their bare hands. At the same time, a person quickly freezes and loses consciousness within two hours. Harrison's room was filled from below with icy water. He wouldn't have survived in such conditions if he had stayed on the floor for several hours. But he managed to build a small platform with a mattress. This kept him slightly above the water level. With each passing hour, fear and despair more and more bound the survivor's mind. He couldn't get out for many reasons. One of them was that only a little sunlight passes to such a depth, and Harrison couldn't see it. The soda bottle was almost empty, and the flashlight stopped working. The man found himself in pitch darkness, but his salvation was close. While rescuers were searching for survivors nearby, he was thinking about his family and life. Harrison noticed rays of light through a hole in the wreckage. Divers were examining the seabed. It was the only chance to survive. Harrison came out of the air pocket and swam towards the rescuers. He was making his way through the darkness. The ray of light coming from the diver's flashlight disappeared. Harrison tried blindly to find the diver, but they were at the other end of the deck. His oxygen was running out, so Harrison decided to return. There was almost no air left in his lungs. He began to suffocate, but still got to the rescue room. The main thing was not to despair. It was his only chance for salvation. After catching his breath and replenishing the oxygen supply in his lungs, Harrison made a second attempt. He got out of the room and noticed the diver. He swam towards them with all of his might. The lifeguard didn't see Harrison, so the cook knocked on his neck from behind and grabbed his hand tightly. The diver was initially scared, but he realized a living person was in front of him. Harrison swam to his room and led the lifeguard as his oxygen ran out. You can easily find a recording from the diver's camera on the internet, where the frightened Harrison was in his rescue room during a meeting with the diver. The rescuers gave him an oxygen mask. They didn't believe there was a living person in front of them. Harrison couldn't immediately get to the surface because of the pressure. He spent about 60 hours on the seabed, so he needed to change the pressure level slowly to prevent damage to his health. Therefore, the divers put him in a decompression chamber to gradually reduce the external pressure. Then, when Harrison got out, he saw the stars. The cook thought that he had been at the bottom of the ocean all day. So he was surprised when he found out that he had been underwater for 60 hours. Also, he thought that all the crew members had forgotten about him and left the ship at the beginning. Many years have passed since then, but Harrison still has nightmares about his air room. Sometimes he wakes up in the middle of the night and tells his wife that the bed is sinking and they're now at sea. A similar case occurred in 1991 with scuba diver Michael Proudfoot. He was studying a sunken submarine off the coast of Baja, California. During this dive, he accidentally broke his breathing regulator and deprived himself of oxygen reserves. Michael couldn't get to the surface because he was too deep. He wouldn't have had enough air in his lungs. Fortunately, the diver found an air pocket inside the ship. 
He swam there and waited for rescuers. For two days, he was underwater in complete darkness. He ate raw sea urchins and drank a small amount of warm water from a found pot. Fortunately, rescuers found him. Michael Proudfoot got out of the trap and stayed alive. Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them, starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. Thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff, but thousands of thin needles, and they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. The cactus is called the jumping cholla, or teddy bear cholla. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping cholla and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. The next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern US and northwestern Mexico. Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators. But its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still, there's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, 
but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, but it's a separate species, Sulpicid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern U.S. These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day, so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania. Under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. If you really meet it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whip scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona bark scorpion. The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. It's one of the most intriguing locations in the world. Covered in darkness and miles underwater, this extreme environment is home to some unusual creatures and phenomena. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest oceanic trench on Earth. No wonder it's been so difficult to explore. Because of the risky conditions, people aren't able to explore this location without proper equipment. But what would happen if we threw a steel ball down there? Let's start with some basics. How did they first discover this enormously deep hole in the ocean? HMS Challenger identified it back in 1875. The ship had some pretty fancy sounding equipment for its time, but it wasn't nearly good enough to be able to fully explore the trench. Some decades later, in 1951, another ship, the HMS Challenger 2, came back to the location better equipped. The vessel featured an echo sounder and was able to take accurate measurements of what seemed to be the deepest point on the surface of our planet. 
If you were to look at it in 2D, you'd see the trench measures 1,500 miles in length and 43 miles in width on average. It also looks sort of like a crescent-shaped scar when you observe it from above. Nothing out of the ordinary so far, right? Well, if you were to stretch a wire from the surface of the ocean to the trench's deepest point, it would measure a staggering seven miles. If we were able to physically move Mount Everest, which is the Earth's tallest mountain, to cover the Mariana Trench, it still wouldn't be enough, falling short by about a mile. Because the Mariana Trench is so deep, it's almost completely covered in darkness, as light can barely get through to such extreme distances underwater. The temperature isn't any friendlier either, just a few degrees above freezing. But the most dangerous feature of them all is the water pressure. Right at the deepest point of the trench, the amount of pressure is about a thousand times higher than the standard atmospheric pressure. Not a lot of people ever attempted to descend into the Mariana Trench. In fact, the first organized attempt took place more than 60 years ago. It was done by Jacques Picard and Don Walsh in a submersible. They only spent about five hours on their descent and a mere 20 minutes at the bottom. Alas, they weren't able to take any pictures. Until these two scientists were able to descend, specialists believed there was little to no chance that life could exist down there, given the conditions, most notably the extreme pressure. But while at the bottom, the submersible's floodlight caught sight of a creature. It was a very flat one indeed. As you can imagine, resources here are very scarce. What kind of creatures live down here? And how do they survive, given the harsh environment? Surprisingly, there is quite an abundance of wildlife living in the Mariana Trench. Some of these creatures fall back on chemicals to survive, like methane or sulfur, while other kinds of fish nibble at the marine life that's, well, weaker than them on the food chain. The most common creatures found here are xenophyophores, amphipods, and small sea cucumbers. Some of them adapted by hardening up their shell using aluminum harnessed from the seawater. Smaller creatures, like microbes, adapted by feeding on the chemicals emitted when the seawater hits the underwater rocks. They consider the Mariana snailfish the rock star of the area in terms of wildlife. They're small, ranging from 3 to 9 inches, translucent, and lacking any scales. But they're the top beast of prey in the area. It's no wonder some people started to believe that the ancient megalodon might still be living here. What was a megalodon, you might be wondering? It was the largest predator ever known in our planet's history. Basically, the biggest and nastiest shark ever to have lived. Scientists believe it's been extinct for quite some time, and the idea that it might still be hiding in the Mariana Trench doesn't have a lot of supporting information. The megalodon would have needed to learn to navigate in complete darkness. It would either have to be bioluminescent or evolve to have massive eyes. More so, because of its school bus-like size, the megalodon would have needed a lot to eat. Microbes and small snailfish just wouldn't have done the trick. If a steel ball were to be dropped in the trench, what would be its effect on it? Would the ball be strong enough to sustain such pressure? Let's look at the science here. If we assume it's a solid steel ball, the pressure found at the bottom of the trench wouldn't be enough to really affect it and cause permanent damage. It would take it a solid 12 minutes to reach the bottom of the ocean, though. What about the temperature? Well, it turns out that the difference in temperature on the surface and at the bottom of the trench is quite impressive, a difference of about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it would cause the ball to shrink a bit, but yet again, once the ball returns to the surface, it would simply come back to normal. Should the ball get stuck there? There's another interesting question to answer. Would corrosion affect it? Corrosion of steel is highly dependent on the amount of oxygen in the water. The amount of oxygen dissolved in water remains constant at depths greater than 3 miles. I'll spare you the math, but it would take more than 10,000 years for the steel ball to completely rust under the sea. I can't help but wonder, though, what would it take us humans to be able to survive at such extreme depths? Let's look at what was used in the past to explore this mysterious location. A little thing called syntactic foam. Why? Because it's the only material that can both float and resist the amount of pressure found here. Without this sort of protection, 
our lungs would rapidly collapse here. More so, the pressure from the water would push liquid into our mouths, replacing the much-needed oxygen with water. Then, there would be the much-needed ability to be able to come back to the surface, should anything not go as planned. One of the vessels that went for a deep dive here had 1,000-pound steel weights attached to it, so it would ensure its sinkage. These weights were connected to the ship by a special type of wire that had an increased corroding time of 11 to 13 hours in seawater, just in case something went wrong down there, and they'd have to bounce back faster. Given the harsh conditions here, the problem of oxygen supply is really important too. Any vessel looking to descend into the Mariana Trench again would need to consider some sort of device that can recycle the air in order to reduce the amount of oxygen that needs to be transported down there. And the last, but definitely not the least of all problems, would be electricity. There surely isn't a power socket down there for you to charge your phone. So, there needs to be enough battery life to support all the necessary equipment, communication, oxygen supply, lighting devices, and so on. None of these problems seem to be quite the challenge anymore, since, as of recently, you can buy a tour of the Mariana Trench. Three lucky individuals were part of such a project back in 2020. They were submerged in a 3.5-inch thick titanium sphere. This ensured that they didn't feel any pressure changes and physiological stresses whatsoever. Each of the guests took part in an individual trip that had an estimated length of about 14 hours. The descent itself took over four hours. Once they reached the bottom, they got the chance to witness some of the most extraordinary creatures on the planet. Then it was time to start the four-hour ascent back to the surface. More than 50 ships and 20 planes have disappeared here since the middle of the 19th century. You won't find this place using an ordinary paper map, since it's not an official region of the Atlantic Ocean. It's just a small area of water in the shape of a triangle located not far from the southeastern coast of the U.S. In the 20th century, this place became a legend. Some believe it's home to a secret base. Others are positive it's a time portal. Ships get caught in a strong storm and move to the past or the future. There's also a theory that the city of Atlantis is located right under the Bermuda Triangle. Its technologies create bursts of energy and destroy ships. Even airplanes have a chance to disappear in this area. All this has gone so far that if something strange happens in the ocean, everyone thinks it's somehow connected with the Bermuda Triangle. The fear of the triangle has been made popular through books and movies. Directors, writers, and journalists like to use this theme. But in their works, you only see a few correct answers. You can find the truth about this place yourself if you look closely. But first, let's refute the weakest theories. Space objects, Atlantis, time travel, all these myths appeared in the middle of the 20th century. There weren't any records about mysterious phenomena before this time. People just noted that a lot of ships were sinking here. But then, one author wrote a book about Atlantis lying in the waters of the Triangle. The author didn't provide any evidence, but he described this hypothesis very convincingly. People read it and liked it. The human psyche likes to read something secret. When you learn something that no one knows about, it makes you feel special. And of course, you begin to believe in this secret. So this was one reason why the Bermuda Triangle book has become so popular. It brought the author a lot of money, and other people also wanted to enrich themselves the same way. Some other fantastic theories about time travel and secret bases have appeared since then. After that, people started making documentaries. All those works devoted to the mystical nature of the triangle were based not on real facts, but on theories from other books. It's impossible to find the truth in this chaos. Some people like to learn secrets, even if they're fake. But you can always find the truth if you really want. Just take any myth and try to find sources proving its reality. Most likely, you'll find nothing but non-scientific books and movies. There are also more realistic things about the triangle, but they are no less interesting. One hypothesis says that ships disappear there because of methane. Deposits of this gas are under the seabed of this region. Sometimes it releases from there and rises to the surface. As soon as methane comes into contact with water, it takes the form of giant bubbles. 
Then these bubbles foam the water and create large waves that flip the ships. This theory is quite real, and such a natural phenomenon exists, but not in the Bermuda Triangle. None of the numerous studies have confirmed the presence of an increased concentration of this gas here. The last methane eruption occurred here about 15,000 years ago. Another realistic theory is rogue waves. They form without storms and winds. The calm water's surface can transform into a big wave, the height of a five-story building, in three seconds. It sinks a ship and then quickly disappears. The sea is calm again, as if there were no waves at all. Some scientists believe a surface sea current colliding with a strong headwind creates this phenomenon. But some recorded cases involved no wind. Another version says the wave is born thanks to the collision of warm and cold currents. But the most exciting theory talks about kinetic vampirism that forms the waves. Under certain natural conditions, waves get the ability to exchange kinetic energy. And among all the waves, there will be the biggest, the vampire one. It absorbs the energy from all the others. When the power is accumulated, the vampire wave splashes it out. This explains the force of the impact and its sudden disappearance. All theories seem logical, but scientists still can't figure out the nature of this phenomenon. Yes, rogue waves can carry ships underwater, but not only in the Bermuda Triangle. They rarely appear in all the waters of the world's oceans. So let's move on to the next theory. Some of those who sailed through this place reported their navigation devices had become unstable. The compass and electronics broke down. The signal and radio communications were lost. We need to look at the triangle from space to find out the reason. If you use special sensors and devices, you'll see that the Earth's magnetic field is weakened above the Bermuda Triangle. This field is a shield that protects us from solar radiation. The ISS astronauts said that the triangle gets more of the sun's particles than any other part of the planet. Therefore, Electronics are unstable in this area. But such failures don't occur with satellites and other space objects flying within our planet's atmosphere. Areas with a weakened magnetic field appear all over the world, and they hardly ever disrupt navigation. This means that ships and planes work stably in such conditions. But all the same, a compass doesn't work correctly in the triangle area. Could it be that some magnetic anomaly affects the navigation systems? This theory was quickly refuted. Scientists regularly check the magnetic map of this region and don't find any deviations from the norm. The reason for the unstable functioning of a compass is not an anomaly. The Bermuda Triangle is one of the few places on the planet where the true north and magnetic poles coincide. True north is the geographical north pole. The magnetic pole is constantly moving around the globe directly to the north. Sometimes these poles collide and cause such a phenomenon as agonic lines. If you fall under this line, your compass will behave strangely and won't point you to the true north. That's why so many ships disappeared in this place at the beginning of the 20th century. People used an ordinary compass. They didn't have modern navigation technologies, and the misfunctioning of the compass could have led to disastrous consequences. Imagine that you're a ship's captain in, let's say, 1901. Your compass is guiding your way. You know you always need to sail north to get to land. Then you get into the Bermuda Triangle. You look at the compass and notice the arrow position has slightly changed. Now you need to move in another direction. This direction is the wrong one, but you don't know about it yet. You take the wrong path and end up in the Caribbean region. This area is full of tiny islands, and the seabed is not deep here. Your ship gets on a shoal. You're stuck and have no idea where you are. That's how some ships disappeared in this region. But if you had GPS, you wouldn't have lost your route and would have sailed safely to land. By the way, now in the 21st century, you can use a compass here without problems, since the magnetic North Pole doesn't meet the true one on the territory of the Bermuda Triangle anymore. The agonic lines are somewhere else right now. But still, for some reason, ships get lost here. And now we come to the most unexpected solution to the Bermuda Triangle problem. Yes, boats sometimes disappear in this region. And the reason for this is... Water, ocean, nature. 
call it whatever you want. Unfortunately, ships sink all over the world. Don't be afraid of just one triangle. There are places in the Atlantic Ocean territory where more boats disappear, and the Bermuda Triangle is not even in the top 10 of them. But why does no one know about them? Well, it's because people wrote fairy tales about one particular place. One of the most popular ship routes of the Atlantic passes through the Bermuda Triangle. Can you guess where most shipwrecks occur statistically? In a place with many sailing ships. That is, in this region. The only true statement about the Bermuda Triangle is frequent storms. But even bad weather and a raging sea doesn't always sink ships. Also, hurricanes often form in the Triangle territory. The Bermuda region has high atmospheric pressure. This pressure diverts storm clouds away towards the Triangle. Strong winds and large waves can sink ships, and lightning flashes can damage planes. But this is not unique. So don't blame the Triangle for all the problems. It's a beautiful and picturesque place that attracts many tourists. Hmm, can we estimate how many ships and airplanes were lost in the Bermuda Triangle? Have their disappearances resulted from human error or weather phenomena? Let's try to find out. We have a curious story of the SS Cotopaxi. This ship vanished in 1925, traveling from Charleston, South Carolina to Havana, Cuba. It never reached its destination. Years later, in the 1980s, a wreck was found 40 miles off St. Augustine, Florida. Since specialists could not precisely determine what and where it came from, they nicknamed it Bear Wreck. It took many additional years of work, done mainly by marine biologists, to identify that this ship was indeed the missing SS Cotopaxi. This was confirmed in January 2020. How did the ship just reappear? And how did it get there, since this mysterious shipwreck isn't even in the Bermuda Triangle? Now, let's see who came up with this term, Bermuda Triangle. Can you actually pinpoint the triangle on a map? No, it's not an officially recognized location either. The Bermuda Triangle does not appear on any world map. Nobody has agreed on its exact boundaries. There were only assumptions with approximations of the entire area, ranging between 500,000 and 1.5 million square miles. By all approximations, the region has a vaguely triangular shape. In 1964, an American author named Vincent Hayes Gaddis first came up with the idea when writing an article for Argosy magazine. He used the Bermuda Triangle to describe a triangular region that has destroyed hundreds of ships and planes without a trace. It is pretty hard to get the number of lost ships and planes because some ships and aircraft have gone missing without leaving a trace. Their wreckage in the region has not been recovered. But the recorded story should help us. Legends about the Bermuda Triangle date back to the 15th century like that of the Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. When sailing through the Atlantic waters, he passed by this location in the late 1400s. In what we now know as the Bermuda Triangle, he saw a huge flame that seemed to just crash into the ocean. Later, he saw an unusual light flashing in the distance at the exact location. Like many other sailors since then, his compass had severe malfunctions. Flight 19, a Navy plane on a routine schedule back in 1945, also started the Bermuda Triangle legend. It was commanded by Lieutenant Charles Taylor, and it's recorded that he just got lost in the triangle for no reason. Since pilots had no GPS back then, they had to trust their compasses and keep track of how long they'd been flying in a specific direction and their speed. Shortly after completing the task, both of the compasses on board stopped working correctly. Records found after the plane's disappearance also indicate that Taylor didn't have a watch on that particular day. The initial report stated that pilot error was to blame for this unfortunate event. However, because people weren't satisfied with this outcome, it was changed to causes or reasons unknown after several reviews. One surviving pilot named Bruce Guerin suggested he went through an electronic fog while passing above the triangle, making him travel through time. In 1970, when this incident happened, he was flying his aircraft when it was surrounded by two huge clouds that formed a whirlpool and spiral. 
Like many others before him, he noticed that his navigation devices were malfunctioning. When he eventually made it out of those clouds, he discovered that his flight had only taken 35 minutes. It should have taken 75 in total. Since he had no other reasonable explanation for what he went through, he believed he must have been pushed forward in time. It's not only strange-looking clouds that have been seen above the Bermuda Triangle. In 2014, a pilot recalled almost colliding with a flying object that he could not identify whatsoever. Some of these strange encounters were even caught on tape. It's the case of an early 2015 flight whose passengers noticed a curious object just floating over the ocean. The pilots have yet to figure out what they actually saw back there. Okay, not all of the possible explanations have been this unusual. Oceanographers, for example, have also tried to explain why ships disappear around here. So they recently came back to one of their old theories, rogue waves. These are immense walls of water that just pop up suddenly. If multiple such waves rise simultaneously, they overlap like a wave sandwich. If one single wave can reach over 30 feet tall and happen simultaneously, it can create a rogue wave that can surpass 100 feet high. These types of waves can quickly overtake even the biggest of ships. Meteorologists came up with their own explanation too – hexagonal clouds. These unusual types of clouds can generate winds of up to 170 miles per hour. And they're pretty significant too some reaching 20 to 55 miles across. As such, waves inside these wind giants can go as high as 45 feet. The Earth's own magnetic force might also have something to do with it. Within the Bermuda Triangle, compasses point to true north, the geographic North Pole, rather than magnetic north, the shifting magnetic North Pole. Some have even explained that since these two perfectly overlap in the Bermuda Triangle, it can cause a magnetic phenomenon that could make navigational devices malfunction. It's called the agonic line. The problem is that scientists have discovered that this line moves each year. It might have passed through the Bermuda Triangle at one point, but it's now through the Gulf of Mexico. Other strange natural phenomenon found along the coast of Norway could help explain why the Bermuda Triangle has claimed so many ships. There are some deep craters there, measuring up to half a mile wide and are 150 feet deep. Scientists believe they were created by methane gas bubbles. This gas seems to be leaking from deposits hidden deep in the seabed. Once the gas reaches a certain quantity, it bursts to the surface and causes eruptions. So, do pilots and ship captains actually avoid this area today? Could this explain why there are fewer ships that get lost there nowadays? But if you've ever flown from Miami to San Juan, Puerto Rico, you probably know that's not true. As for ships, if people would avoid the Bermuda Triangle, nearly all Caribbean vacations would be spoiled. To this day, there are a lot of flights that go over the Bermuda Triangle, so it's clear nobody is avoiding it. This place is one of the most heavily traveled shipping lanes in the world. Nowadays, the Bermuda Triangle has heavy daily traffic, both by sea and air. But the Bermuda Triangle is indeed subject to tropical storms and hurricanes that happen very often. Let's also keep in mind that the Gulf Stream, a strong ocean current that causes sharp changes in local weather, passes through the Bermuda Triangle. Besides, the deepest point in the Atlantic Ocean, the Milwaukee Depth, is also located in the Bermuda Triangle. The Puerto Rico Trench reaches almost 27,500 feet at the Milwaukee depth. So, if you think about it, the whole mystery is a perfect combination of human error, bad weather, and a lot of ship traffic. This was confirmed by data provided by the U.S. Coast Guard. If you look at percentages, the number of ships or planes that go missing in the Bermuda Triangle isn't different from anywhere else. Disappearances do not happen more often than in any comparable region of the Atlantic Ocean. Official statistics say around 50 ships and 20 airplanes have vanished while traveling through this region. So that's another reason why the total number is so hard to pinpoint. Nobody could describe its rescue in official records if a boat was reported missing. 
there were also some events that, it turns out, didn't happen at all, adding to those false reports. Like that of a plane crash back in 1937 off Daytona Beach, Florida, that local papers surprisingly revealed nothing about. Texas is home to some of the oddest, creepiest, and most unusual animals you've ever heard of. It might come as a surprise, but this state is full of creatures you'll hardly see in other places. So, let's have a look at the most amazing ones. This truly beautiful bright blue creature is called the Blue Sea Dragon. Despite such an imposing name, the critter is actually tiny, usually no bigger than a grape. You may find it on the beach or floating beside you in the water. Now, you need to remember one thing. However pretty this little slug may look, never ever touch it. One tourist spotted a few of these pretty dragons on the shore of Mustang Island. He scooped one of the creatures up. He wanted to film it. Luckily, he put it back into the water before it could sting him. Otherwise, it would have ended badly since the blue sea dragon is venomous. Despite their tiny size, their sting can pack a punch. All because of their diet. Their favorite dish is the Portuguese man o' war, a jellyfish that has enough venom to paralyze small fish and crustaceans. The blue dragons first use mucus to neutralize the jellyfish's infamous stinging cells. And then they steal these cells from the man o' war's tentacles and store and concentrate them within their own tissues. Then they release these stinging cells on contact which makes their own sting more powerful, even worse than that of the man -o war itself. These awesome creatures are also extremely sneaky. Even though their appearance is bright, to say the least, they're well-known masters of disguise. You see that vibrant blue coloring is actually on their bellies. And when they float on their backs, they simply blend with the water. As for their backs, they're gray to camouflage these animals on the seafloor. Now, how about a funny fact? A group of tiny dragons floating together is called a blue fleet. And another fact, blue dragons normally lay a string of around 16 eggs. And it takes them three days or so to hatch into larvae. Blue sea dragons rarely make it to the shore. They're soft-bodied, so when the animals finally get through the surf zone and are deposited on the shore, they're already broken apart. And still, watch out! Even in this case, the venom in their bodies doesn't dissipate. But of course, blue sea dragons aren't the only unusual animals inhabiting Texas. Have a look at this nightmarish creature. Poisonous, slimy, and kinda immortal. Meet the hammerhead worm. The worst thing? It might be lurking in your garden while you're watching this video. You can easily recognize this worm by its creepy spade-shaped head. It doesn't look like any other invertebrate you've ever seen. Or any other creature, that is. At first, it was only found in East Texas. But later, researchers spotted these spine-chilling creatures in North, Central, and South Texas. Basically everywhere but the arid areas of West Texas. One of the most terrifying things about this worm might be its length. This creature can grow as long as one foot. Luckily, such giants aren't very common. Most hammerhead worms only reach 6 inches in length. You can come across two species of these worms in Texas, and both of them will have a dark stripe down the middle. The larger of these two species munches on earthworms, which is actually a big problem. You might know that earthworms play an important role in keeping the soil rich in minerals and overall healthy. If earthworms disappear, Plants in such areas won't be getting the nutrients they need. Even for humans and pets, meeting a hammerhead worm isn't the most pleasant experience either. Hammerheads are the only terrestrial invertebrates that secrete a very dangerous neurotoxin, the same as pufferfish produce. Thanks to the sheer size of the human body, touching a hammerhead worm won't hurt you too much, but it may still cause your hand to start tingling or even go numb it's much more dangerous for pets. There have been cases when dogs ate hammerheads which left them feeling sick for the whole day. Interestingly, these worms are native to Southeast Asia. 
but they must have mastered the art of hitchhiking, since in the early 1900s, they were already found in the US. Keep in mind that if you want to get rid of a hammerhead worm, which is the best course of action, the worst thing you can do is chop it with a shovel. The thing is, flatworms reproduce by ripping themselves in half. So by cutting it, you actually help the populations of the worms, turning one into two. That's the reason why hammerheads are sometimes described as immortal, which is a bit of a stretch since these creatures can't survive in vinegar or salt. Now, even though you're safe from the hammerhead worm in West Texas, it doesn't mean you can't come across another dangerous animal, such as the land lobster from hell. These creatures are also known as vinegaroons, and they're not real crustaceans. They're arachnids. Huh? Who would have guessed? Anyway, these eight-legged critters have a really nasty bite, but it's not the worst thing about them. Land lobsters, brace yourself, spray vinegar-like 85% acid from their tails. Mostly they do it to protect themselves, but it still sounds like an unfriendly thing to do, right? A land lobster can also pinch a finger that's gotten too close with its heavy mouth parts. At the base of their abdomens, vinegaroons have long whip-like tails. That's why these arachnids are often called whip scorpions, even though they're neither related to scorpions nor have stingers. Summer rains lure these arachnids out of their burrows in search of food and love. Luckily, experts claim that land lobsters aren't poisonous to humans but they're very likely to leave a mark with their large pinchers, which they use to capture insects. Vinegaroons can be considered useful since they eat millipedes, crickets, scorpions, and cockroaches. They hunt by sensing the vibrations of their prey with those long front legs of theirs. Since land lobsters prefer to come out after dark, you aren't likely to see one in the daylight. But if you stumble upon one, check it out. If it's a female, it may be carrying her hatchlings on her back. Now, imagine it's the middle of spring and you're walking among blooming flowers and greenery. Suddenly, you spot something extremely bizarre on the ground. The animal looks cute, fluffy, and soft looking. The desire to touch it is irresistible. Watch out! The sting of the hairy caterpillar can pack a serious punch. This one is called the pus moth caterpillar, or asp. There are several stinging caterpillar species in Texas. The buck moth caterpillar, spiny oak slug caterpillar, saddleback caterpillar, and eel moth caterpillar. And touching any of them can lead to unpleasant consequences. If you had touched that pretty hairy thing in the park, you'd most likely start feeling a burning sensation and develop an itchy rash. In the worst case scenario, you'd even have to go to the emergency room. The main problem is that people react very differently to caterpillar toxins. Some may develop more severe reactions than others. Plus, how bad the consequences are also depends on the thickness of the skin in the affected area. In most cases, the unpleasant sensation and rash go away in a few hours or sometimes days. On the bright side, such caterpillars later turn into moths and butterflies that help pollinate flowers and trees. Getting rid of these critters means doing a massive disservice to the area where you live. Specialists are sure that coming across a stinging caterpillar won't lead to anything bad if you keep in mind the rule of thumb. If a caterpillar looks fuzzy, don't touch it. And the best solution to dealing with such creatures is educating people on what such caterpillars are what they look like, and why it's dangerous to touch them with unprotected hands. Imagine a planet where every breath you take electrifies your body like a shot of espresso. The sky above you is an intense shade of blue, while colossal trees stretch towards the heavens, their vibrant green leaves growing at an astonishing rate. Daily exercise becomes a thrill like no other. With the abundance of oxygen, you become a supercharged version of yourself. Running feels effortless as you dart across the landscape, lifting weights that would normally seem impossible. It's as if the world itself is infused with a surge of energy. Everything is moving faster. The wildlife surrounding you is equally affected by this oxygen overload. 
Animals roam the land in majestic proportions. Their massive frames are propelled by speed and agility. Picture yourself in a pulse-pounding chase with an oxygen-charged cheetah, racing against a predator that could put a Ferrari to shame. Now you may wonder how such a wild scenario could ever be possible. Well, let's see. Oxygen is the powerful fuel that keeps life going. It makes up about 21% of the air we breathe, and every breath we take delivers these tiny molecules to our cells, giving them the energy they need to thrive. Without oxygen, our cells would struggle, and our bodies would fall apart. But that's not all. Oxygen is a superstar that works for all kinds of living things, from tiny bacteria to giant elephants. It's even important underwater, where it enriches the oceans. Amazing creatures like plankton and algae produce lots of oxygen, creating a thriving underwater world. But to fully understand the impact of high oxygen levels on the planet, prepare for a journey back in time. Recently, scientists have made an astonishing discovery. They tested rocks from two different places that were really far apart. And can you believe it? These rocks held tiny pockets of gas that showed how oxygen levels shot up by almost a third in a very short time. It was like a breath of fresh air. So they studied these rocks and found that oxygen levels back then were much higher. Imagine lush landscapes, towering forests, and gigantic swamps that stretched as far as you could see. During the Carboniferous period, oxygen ruled the atmosphere at an impressive 20%, just like today. But over the next 50 million years, its levels shot up to a crazy 35%. Can you imagine what that did? As oxygen surged, something incredible happened. Huge forests grew all over the land, creating a breathtaking green world. And massive swamps took over low-lying areas, making the landscape look surreal and otherworldly. At the same time, carbon dioxide levels dropped. Normally, when things break down, microbes release carbon dioxide into the air. This gas acts like a warm blanket, trapping the sun's heat and raising temperatures. But in the mysterious swamps where these giant plants were buried, the microbes couldn't do their job. The result? The planet got really cold. Who would have thought that a breath of fresh air could have such power? The scientists are still trying to figure out why this happened. But one thing is certain, it wasn't just happening in one place. It was a worldwide phenomenon. It was like the planet was playing a funny game with the climate. But let's go even earlier. We see the first North American dinosaurs making their grand entrance. High oxygen levels are what gave a big boost to the rise of mighty dinosaurs in North America and beyond. Picture tropics filled with the magnificent giant creatures. Obviously, dinosaurs didn't just appear out of nowhere. They took advantage of a changing environment that was perfect for their evolution. Oxygen levels played a huge part in this dinosaur party. As oxygen levels rose, so did the size of these incredible creatures. They started small with predators like Chindosaurus, and soon after, huge dinosaurs like sauropods took over the land. Then, 65 million years ago, dinosaurs disappeared and mammals took over. And here's the interesting part. Mammals never grew as big as dinosaurs. So what's the explanation for this? Mammals, and humans are mammals too, by the way, are special because we can regulate our body temperature. But that comes at a cost. We need a lot of energy to stay warm compared to reptiles and dinosaurs. Dinosaurs didn't bother with temperature control, so they could focus on growing big. The biggest dinosaurs were 10 times larger than the largest mammals. It's like a game of anything you can do, I can do 10 times bigger. Dinosaurs might have had similar limitations with their sizes, but those were much less strict. Before the dinosaurs' extinction, mammals were very small. Many mammal species disappeared along with the dinosaurs. But survivors took advantage of the open ecosystem and rapidly diversified into various body sizes. However, after 42 million years of growth, mammals reached a size plateau. This happened on all continents, most likely because of the temperature and land area. Colder environments allowed mammals to grow larger. Balancing body size and heat became challenging. Land area also played a role in sustaining big populations. But making animals bigger isn't the only thing high oxygen can do. This humble gas is a true jack of all trades. It also acts as our loyal bodyguard, protecting us from harmful UV rays and other dangers from space. Without oxygen, we would be defenseless against space threats. 
Oxygen also has a fascinating role in shaping the weather. It teams up with its other atmospheric buddies to make the sky go wild with tornadoes, hurricanes, and thunderstorms. They mix and mingle in the air, creating just the right conditions for these exciting weather adventures to happen. And these adventures can be dangerous, but they serve an important purpose. They help distribute nutrients and organic matter, carrying soil, leaves, and debris to new places. So what if we decided to mess with nature and crank up the oxygen levels to crazy heights, 30%, 40%, or even 50%? Well, too much of a good thing can become dangerous. Oxygen toxicity is when too much of this gas causes big problems. It's like eating loads of candy. It's fun at first, but soon enough you'll regret it. Surprisingly, an overdose of oxygen can leave you struggling for breath, like a tired dancer in desperate need of a break. At first you might feel a burst of energy, but it doesn't last. Dizziness sets in, as if you've been spinning on the dance floor for hours without stopping. In extreme cases, too much oxygen can even harm your body, making you feel like you've crashed into a huge truck. So while oxygen is always with us, giving us life, it's important to appreciate its delicate balance. Don't put on your special breathing gear. Also, we wouldn't be the only creatures to suffer from this oxygen extravaganza. Mammals, for example, will struggle to adapt to these extreme levels. The balance of power among species will change drastically, and winners and losers will fight for survival in a world that's spinning out of control and we'll need stronger shelters to deal with these gigantic animals. We'll have to stay nimble and avoid danger. Amidst all the chaos, there will be astonishing adaptations. Birds will fly higher than ever before, reaching heights that would amaze even the clouds. Also, get ready for more natural disasters and delicate ecosystems hanging in the balance. Fires will start quickly and rage fiercely, making wildfires a constant threat. Even a small spark from a campfire could cause disaster. We'll need to rethink our cooking and heating methods to stay safe in this oxygen-filled world. But let's not forget the other side of the oxygen story. If we had a planet with low oxygen, only around 15%, we would face a completely different struggle. Every breath would be difficult, leaving us tired and struggling for air. Physical activity would become extremely hard, and our memory and focus would suffer. So let's be grateful for the oxygen levels we have now. They're the perfect balance for us to thrive. In this exhilarating journey through an oxygen-rich world, we've experienced breathtaking wonders and discovered the delicate balance of our planet. Let's cherish the magic in every breath, respect the interplay of oxygen and life, and embrace the thrill of this remarkable ride called life. You're walking along the riverbank. It's quiet, save for the water's peaceful burbling. The hot Georgia sun beats down on your neck. That's when you notice something strange on the ground. Looks like a quarter-sized black coin with a weird pattern on it. You bend over for a closer look. Is it a coin? This thing looks like an ancient seal with a symbol carved in it. It's probably from some long-lost civilization. You could sell it and make a fortune. You crouch down on one knee to pick up your newfound treasure. As soon as your finger touches it, you pull your hand back as fear wells in your gut. It's hairy. You go to pick it up again, digging your nails in the dirt around it to pull it out of the ground. That's when it moves. Your heart jumps in your throat. It's pounding so hard you can feel it in your head. The fear turns to horror when the coin wiggles its way out of the ground. It's no ancient treasure. It's a huge spider! A ravine trapdoor spider, to be precise. This hard, coin-looking growth on the back of its body serves as a shield. The eight-legged terrors burrow into the ground and plug it like a cork so hungry enemies can't get to them. Or, you know, giant confused humans like you. The spider is venomous, but its bite isn't toxic to humans. Who, lucky you! But I didn't say you wouldn't feel it. Best stay away from those sizable pincer-like fangs. Ow! Well, so much for your riches. Perhaps fortune awaits you in Mexico's Baja California Peninsula. You're walking on dried-up ground when you notice a long white stripe up ahead. You get closer. Oh, looks like a super long worm, you think to yourself. 
But it doesn't move like any worm you've ever seen. That's when you see it has arms and a head. This pale creature with black beady eyes is a Mexican mole lizard. It lives in the ground where all its dinner of insects and termites hang out. It rarely comes out, so you're pretty lucky to have seen this bizarre reptile. Now you're in a rainforest in northeastern Australia. Ahead, half hidden among the trees, you notice something large and round. This mysterious figure lying on the ground is covered in black hair. At first, you think it's a bear curled up sleeping. But that wouldn't make any sense. There are no bears down under. You're getting closer when a twig snaps under your foot. The thing hears you and springs to its legs. It turns to you, and you now see this is a bizarre and beautiful bird. That black hair is actually a thick coat of long, fine feathers. This formidable fowl has a bright blue head with a large horn on top. It stands on two powerful legs with a dagger-like claw on each foot that can be as long as your hand. Take away those feathers, and you might mistake this thing for a velociraptor. But it's actually a cassowary the most dangerous bird in the world. It could jump straight over your head if it wanted to, definitely high enough to kick you in the chest. And its blows are strong enough to break bone, not to mention that claw that can cut through anything like butter. This bird was made to hunt and avoid being hunted. Don't even consider running away. Not unless you too can sprint over 30 miles per hour. Diving into that lake over there won't save you either. This bird is an excellent swimmer. Best just to back away slowly and hope it doesn't come after you. Another creature that proves it's best to keep your hands to yourself is the panda ant. The naming is obvious. It's black and white and furry like the beloved bamboo-chewing bear. This furry little bugger lives in the forests of Chile. But don't go to pet this fluffy little ant. What you're looking at is no ant at all. It's a species of wasp. That black and white coloring serves one purpose, to warn others of this insect's powerful sting. And if that doesn't make you back away, the wasp will let out a squeaking sound. It sounds cute to us humans, but it means a painful sting is around the corner. These insects are loners. They don't live in colonies and don't have nests. They're also parasites. A female panda ant lays eggs next to the larvae of another insect. Then, the hatched babies use these larvae as food. Surely you've seen bugs that look like leaves and twigs. But what about a creature that looks like a beautiful orchid? You can find this fragrant flower in the forest or a green field among other plants. But make sure that's a flower you're leaning in toward to smell. If it's not, you risk being bitten by a praying mantis. The orchid mantis is nearly impossible to distinguish among the flowers. It has pink-white coloring with legs and claws that look identical to little petals. It uses its resemblance to the plant to hide from predators and hunt insects that love these flowers. A butterfly or a bee flies up to the flower when one of the petals starts moving. The unsuspecting meal might take it as simply the wind. But then the petal turns into a sharp claw that suddenly grabs the insect. Now imagine you're in the jungles of Costa Rica. You notice a brown snake sitting on a tree branch in front of your face. The snake looks like it's about to strike. Well, you want to run away as far as possible, but notice that this snake is unusually short, and it doesn't lash out at you. You wait, but the snake keeps staring at you. It doesn't even hiss. (laughs) Lucky for you, it'll never bite because it's not a snake, but a caterpillar. The hawk moth caterpillar can change the shape of its body to look like a menacing serpent. This easily scares away any hungry foes. The coloring and pattern on the skin imitates a snake's scales and eyes. This insect also knows how to move like a reptile. A master of disguise, this one! Let's get out of the hot jungle and head to Central Europe. You're in the middle of a sunny green meadow. Colorful flowers bloom around. Birds sing and bees buzz by. Among the bees, some are not what they seem. You'd hardly be able to distinguish the imposters. But if you look really closely, you'll see the golden bee fly moving through the air. It looks like a bumblebee, but it's the buzzer's biggest enemy. 
the golden bee fly sneaks into bee nests and lays eggs there. Its larvae hatch and feed on the bees and flower nectar. The yellow and black coloring allows the intruder to go undetected the whole time. The camouflage also keeps enemies away. Nothing would touch this fly if it thinks it'll get a bumblebee sting. The next spot on your journey is the rainforest in southern Thailand. Now, be extra careful and watch your step. Not because the next animal is poisonous or bites, but because you might actually step on it. The leaves from the trees have fallen and turned a gray-brown hue. Among these leaves, it's tough to distinguish the Malaysian horned leaf frog. Its body shape, coloring, and especially those pointy growths coming out above its eyes all allow this amphibian to hide perfectly among the fallen foliage. This frog can sit for hours in one place, waiting for its next meal to come close enough to... Now you're in a garden. You see a beautiful, bright flower and a small bird hovering near it. The bird flaps its wings so quickly you can hardly see them. And that long, needle-like beak makes you immediately assume you're looking at a hummingbird. But as soon as you get closer, you realize this is not a bird, but an insect. Fortunately, the hummingbird hawk moth isn't venomous and doesn't sting. It's just a lovely little creature that decorates the garden with its presence. Many people even grow plants rich in nectar to attract these moths. Hey, that's an idea! Flies are everywhere we go, literally. It's believed that flies originated in Asia. But these days, they live everywhere people live, only excluding Antarctica and maybe a couple of islands. Flies have traveled the oceans following humans, but they never go anywhere alone. In the wilderness and deserts where humans are absent, you won't find any flies. We know them well, but we all have that unanswered question about flies. Why do flies rub their limbs? Turns out, they just clean them. It's this simple. A fly has hair all over its body. The hairs on the limbs serve as detectors for flying, finding food, and doing whatever else the fly business is. They have to keep their limbs clean at all times. So they just rub them every time they get a chance. Their limbs are sensitive, and they serve more than one purpose. Apparently, the limbs have taste receptors, so the flies can taste with their feet. They can land on their potential meal and wander around it, giving it a good taste before consuming it. Flies can't chew, so they're on an all-liquid diet and drink their food. If the food they have picked as their next meal is solid, they have a special ritual to make it edible. A fly regurgitates digestive juices on their soon-to-be food, and those juices break it into the smallest pieces that can be drunk. Also, spitting out those juices frees up space in their stomachs for new food. Quite often, flies sit on our food. They can appear harmless, but it's not exactly true. First, remember that they spill out those juices onto your food, which is already gross enough. But there's more. You have to keep in mind that flies land everywhere, and it's not always flowers, but all the gross stuff as well. And flies especially like that said gross stuff like rotting foods, dumpsters, and even worse. So, their limbs collect all the germs and microbes from those places. When a fly lands on your food, it transfers those germs to your meal. Some of the microbes they transfer can even cause diseases like cholera and typhoid. There was even an experiment once made to demonstrate how it works. There were two bowls. One contained a red powder of some kind of spice, and the other bowl had white rice in it. Flies were let in, and they would migrate from the spice bowl to the rice bowl and back. Soon enough, rice got covered with red spice. Now, replace harmless spice with something grosser, and rice with your dinner. So you should always cover your food to make sure some fly doesn't take a walk on it and step and spit all over it. If you're eating, make sure you swat them away. But don't worry if some annoying fly manages to sit on your sandwich for a second before you kick it out. No need to throw the sandwich out. If you act it fast, then you're safe. Also, experts say that an average healthy human has a strong enough immune system to repel parasites. Even though flies are gross and annoying, bugging around and tickling you with their limbs, they do serve some good. 
They're responsible for pollinating flowers. They collect nectar from them, which gets stuck to their hair on their bodies. And then they pollinate the next flower when landing on it. Also, if flies didn't exist, our planet would be even dirtier. Flies recycle some of the human waste. Flies are also an important part of the ecosystem since they're food for birds, spiders, lizards, frogs, and many more. Without flies, they'd all go extinct. Apart from flies having the superpower of tasting with their feet, there are other interesting facts about them too. They can walk on both horizontal and vertical surfaces and even upside down. They can do it because each one of a fly's feet has two pads with tiny hair. And those hairs produce a glue-like substance that allows flies to have an excellent grip. Flies have unique eyes, which have a large complex of 3,000 to 6,000 simpler eyes within each of the two compound eyes. A fly's eyes don't move, but its vision is nearly 360 degrees. They can see behind their back, so wherever you are, a fly definitely sees you and every other danger with one or a few of their thousands of monitors. In addition to the two compound eyes, flies also have three simple eyes located on their foreheads, which serve as a compass and allow a fly to navigate. They also have an amazing reaction time. Ever wondered why it's so hard to swat a fly? Well, to a fly, we're sloths. That's because they see things in slow motion compared to us. Species have different perceptions of speed. The speed we see will be twice faster for a turtle, and it will be four times slower for a fly. Turn a video on at 0.25 times speed and imagine someone approaching you with this speed. Well, that's how a fly sees you. So yes, it has enough time to escape. A fly has just one set of wings. But in addition to their pair of wings, they also have so-called halters, which allow them to take off fast. Millions of years ago, halters were serving as a second pair of wings. Now they help to take off and also to balance the air. If a fly loses one of the halters, it'll start flying in circles. And if both of them go missing, it won't be able to fly anymore at all. Also, even though their wings beat up to 1,000 times per minute, they're also very slow flyers, only reaching the speed of 4.5 miles per hour. If a fly lives in an urban area with enough people and garbage around, it doesn't fly far away from the place of residence, only having a territory of a bit over 3,200 feet. Rural flies are far more explorative, and they can fly away up to seven miles at a time. A fly doesn't live long. Its lifetime is just around 30 days. But during this time, they lay from 500 to 800 eggs each on average. But it's not 1,000 at once, it's several goes throughout their life, with 75 to 100 eggs at once. The eggs hatch within 24 hours, and it takes a week in total for an egg to turn into a grown fly, and then the cycle continues. In colder climates, this process can take twice as long. A timber fly is the biggest fly species, which lives in Central and South America. They can grow up to 3.15 inches. Also, flies have beds, or more like their favorite spot to stay and sleep. They have a comfy place, somewhere close to their source of food, and they come there to rest at night. If you ever had your house flooded with flies, here are a few tips for you to reduce their population. First, it's important to understand what they're attracted to. They're attracted to other flies and even to the smell of flies living there. And flies have an amazing sense of smell. So if you hosted even one fly, expect to get more guests. If you have any traces of flies, like fly specks, they'll find you too. Make sure to wash your walls and surfaces. Next, flies love garbage and rotting produce. They lay eggs in rotten food and meat, so make sure to keep your food in the fridge, cover it, and keep the trash in tightly sealed containers. And of course, take out the trash regularly. Flies have a sweet tooth, or more like a sweet foot, since they taste with their feet. And they love syrup and other sugary liquids. They're also fond of soda and vinegar. 
So make sure to keep those stored and always wipe after yourself if you spill something. Lastly, they like to hide and live in dirty and leaky drains. They eat the bacteria from there. So always clear your drains and repair any leaks right away. Also, it'll help to seal all the cracks in your floor, ceiling, and walls if you have any. That's one of their ways to get into the house. The Baltic Sea Anomaly. In 2011, a diving team came down to the bottom of the northern part of the Baltic Sea. They went on a treasure hunt. But what they came upon was a pretty weird object. When they took photos and showed them to others, many believed it was a sunken spaceship of another civilization. Other people thought that some natural causes formed the object, but the metals inside the structure definitely couldn't have been formed naturally. Now, some scientists even believe it was something that appeared way back in the Ice Age. Maybe it was even a meteorite that ended up trapped under ice back then. A maelstrom is a whirlpool, some sort of a powerful rotational current that forms when two currents collide and create a circular vortex. Even fearless Vikings were afraid of maelstroms because those were forces so powerful that they could sink large ships. These whirlpools remain dangerous even today. But luckily, not for big modern ships that are large enough to withstand the power of maelstroms. But a cruise ship that gets into a maelstrom usually faces massive waves that can rock even big vessels from side to side pretty intensely. A maelstrom can be so strong, it can turn into some sort of an underwater black hole. Yep, black holes are not only present in the cold expanse of space, you can find them here on our home planet too, swirling in the oceans. They're similar to those in space, since they're compacted so tightly that nothing they trap can escape. Underwater black holes often span up to 93 miles in diameter. And if you got into one of those, you probably wouldn't even know it. These black holes act like vortices, but because of their size, even professionals can hardly see their boundaries. Here's something relaxing. Next time you go to the beach, pay attention, and maybe you'll see an optical phenomenon called the green flash. You can see it shortly after sunset or right before sunrise. It occurs when the sun is almost completely below the horizon, while its rim, the upper one, is still visible. For just a second or two, that upper edge of the sun will appear green. It's because you're looking at the sun through thicker parts of the atmosphere as it's moving down in the sky. As it's dipping below the horizon, light refracts, or bends, in the atmosphere and gets dispersed. Wait for a clear day with no clouds or haze on the horizon to see this phenomenon better. You've been looking forward to a nice swim, only to realize that the water in the ocean is… red? Better avoid going in. Florida is known for its red tides. It occurs when the concentration of specific microscopic algae is higher than normal. Thousands of species of algae in marine and fresh waters are mostly harmless to animals and humans. They even help us, since they're an important source of oxygen. But some, like the algae that makes the ocean red, can be extremely dangerous for marine animals, like sea turtles, fish, and seabirds. This kind can grow out of control and produce neurotoxins harmful to humans, especially those who have some respiratory issues. Such people should avoid red tide areas especially when winds are strong enough to push the algae toward the shore. Volcanoes can spew poisonous gas, ash, and red-hot lava. Those are the most obvious dangers most of us already know about. But submarine volcanoes can be very tricky in their own way. Sometimes, when they're located in shallow waters, they reveal their presence by blasting debris of rock and steam high above the surface. Since submarine volcanoes are surrounded by an unlimited supply of water, they can behave differently from those on land. When they erupt, seawater gets into active submarine vents. Lava can be spreading across a shallow sea floor, or sometimes even flowing into the sea from land volcanoes. When in water, it may cool down so quickly that it shatters into rubble and sand. So, 
there are large amounts of volcanic debris left there. You know those popular black sand beaches in Hawaii? That's how they formed. Hot lava and powerful eruptions certainly don't sound safe. But submarine volcanoes in deeper waters are equally dangerous. Even though they're not necessarily erupting, they produce pockets of bubbles. These bubbles reduce the density of the surrounding waters, which can even sink ships. The worst thing is that when you look at the surface of the ocean, you can't understand something's wrong. But at the same time, tiny bubbles are there, causing ships to lose buoyancy and with very little warning. A cross sea is a rare phenomenon, beautiful to observe, but also very dangerous. It's when you see square waves, which are more common in shallow parts of the ocean. That's something you can often see in France or on certain beaches of Tel Aviv. But it can also happen in many coastal areas across the world. A cross sea occurs when two wave patterns travel at oblique angles. They form this checkerboard-like pattern. It mostly happens when two swells meet, or when a swell pushes waves in one direction while a strong wind pushes them in another. These square waves can be dangerous for swimmers and boaters. The waves produced by strong ocean currents can be pretty unpredictable and tall, sometimes up to almost 10 feet. This phenomenon is sometimes called white walls. These waves can be so powerful that they can turn over even big boats. If you fill a clear glass with some ocean water and take a closer look, you'll see it's full of very small particles. Seawater contains dissolved salts, fats, algae, proteins, detergents, and other bits of artificial and organic matter. If you shake that glass, you'll see tiny bubbles forming on its surface. That's how sea foam forms when waves and winds agitate the ocean. When you see thick sea foam, algal blooms might have caused it. When big blooms of algae fall apart in the sea, large amounts of that matter move in the direction of dry land. Most kinds of sea foam aren't dangerous to humans, but when blooms of algae fall apart, it can have a negative impact on both the environment and people. For example, when sea foam bubbles pop, the toxins they contain get released into the air, and they can irritate your eyes or cause some other health issues. You can see a tidal bore in the areas where a river empties into a sea or an ocean. It's a powerful tide that goes against the current and pushes up the river. A tidal bore falls into a category of something called the surge, which is a sudden change in depth. A tidal bore is a positive surge, which means it pushes up a river, making it much deeper. A negative surge is when the river suddenly becomes very shallow. You won't see tidal bores everywhere. The river must be fairly shallow with a narrow outlet to the sea. The place where the sea and the river meet must be flat and wide. Also, the area between low and high tide must be at least 20 feet across. Of course, there are some exceptions, like the Amazon River, the world's largest one. The mouth of the Amazon is not narrow, but the river experiences tidal bores. That's because its mouth is shallow and has many sandbars and low-lying islands. The tidal bore is so strong there that the river doesn't even have a delta. Its sediment goes directly into the Atlantic Ocean, where fast-moving currents take it away. A tidal bore is often unpredictable and can be extremely rough. In many cases, it changes the color of the river from greenish or blue to brown. It can damage vegetation or even tear trees out of the ground. So, recreation sports like kayaking and river surfing can be hazardous in these areas. Even if you just want to take a look at a tidal bore, be careful. Tidal waves can sweep over lookout points and drag whatever or whoever is there into the churning river. Now, apart from being a great food additive and warding off vampires, garlic has cleansing properties that can make things more tolerable around the bathroom. And we can all use that. Freshly crushed garlic cloves contain a variety of antimicrobial properties. Allison reduces the buildup of bacteria and fungi. The natural cleansing properties of garlic are not only great for the mm. environment, but they can also help you avoid the need to constantly clean the toilet. 
Simply crush up a piece of garlic and put it into your toilet bowl before you go to bed. The next morning, flush the toilet. The Allison has done the grueling task of cleaning the toilet for you. Doing this two times a week will ensure a very clean toilet bowl. Hair grease and grime build up over time and eventually clog the drains. Removing the blockage is easy with salt and vinegar. Using a small bowl, add 1 cup of vinegar and 1 cup of salt and mix thoroughly until it's evenly combined. Pour the mixture into the drain and wait for 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the severity of the clog. This method will save on money, further showing that salt and vinegar aren't just good on chips, but they are. Now to further ensure the drain is clear of not only the blockage, but also the smell, add three and a half ounces of baking soda. Boil six ounces of water and mix in one cup of vinegar. Pour the baking soda into the drain, followed by the boiling water and vinegar mix. It will begin sizzling once the reaction starts, so just sit back and let it do its thing. An hour later, the blockage, along with the smell, will be gone. Scorched pans tend to use a lot of elbow grease, but they can be cleaned a lot easier with the right ingredients. Fill your pot or pan with water and add in about 1 cup of vinegar. Bring the liquid to a boil, then remove the pan from the heat before it completely dries up, ensuring there is a small amount of liquid remaining. Sprinkle baking soda on the base, covering the bird parts. A couple of teaspoons should be enough to form a slurry. Watch and wait as the soda fizzes, continue to move the pan around to ensure you cover the scorched areas. Once the fizzing stops, you're free to scrub away. Vinegar by itself can be used for many purposes. A couple of teaspoons mixed with water in a spray bottle will easily remove salt stains from shoes. Pour white vinegar into a container and place rusty tools inside. Overnight, the vinegar will eat away at the rust. After 24 hours, as you wipe it, you will be able to remove the corrosion easily. Baking soda also removes foul odors on furniture and carpet, as it gradually absorbs all the acidic odors within a covered area. Baking soda is a pH neutralizer, which means it absorbs smells that are acidic in nature. This includes most of the nasty smells we find throughout our living areas. When applying, ensure you are very generous while spreading. Leave it on the required area for at least an hour, and for best results, leave it on overnight. Then just suck it up with a vacuum cleaner. Charcoal contains the same odor-removing elements, only better, and deals with a greater variety of particles. However, you don't want to exchange smells for patches of black stains from the charcoal, but putting them into air freshener sachets and hiding them underneath the cushions will have the desired effect without the mess. There are various forms of cleaning you can do with vinegar. The reason why it's so effective is the acetic acid content, which is more powerful than other natural ingredients like coffee and orange juice. There is a process involved for vinegar to develop into the crime-fighting liquid that it is. The acetic acid that makes up the effective properties it can be used on many surfaces without damaging them. Not only is it beneficial for cleaning and removing stains, but also for polishing copper, brass, bronze, and silver. Given its benefits for almost anything, it'll give your dishwasher an extra boost with a natural cleanse. Just fill up half a bowl of white vinegar and place it on the top rack before you start the machine. Then witness the immaculate results. Within the small space of a microwave, you can combine two cups of water with one quarter cup of lemon juice in an open dish. Run the microwave on high for eight minutes. The steam from the solution will get absorbed into the crusty layers within the microwave. And once complete, it'll be easier to clean, leaving a fresh, lemony smell. Mm. Using the oil of cloves and cinnamon, you can soak cotton balls in them and place them in small bags inside your closet. Moths and other insects can't stand these ingredients, which will ensure that your clothes remain untouched. Using similar ingredients, you can create your own humidifier with the stove in the winter. Simply fill a can two-thirds of the way with water, adding cinnamon sticks, cloves, and orange peel, and place it on the stove. While it adds moisture to the air, it'll also provide a soothing scent. Scratches, nicks, and marks made on wooden furniture can be restained with a pecan by simply rubbing it on the scratched or damaged area. Has your stainless steel cutlery and other flatware lost its shine? 
Put them in a small pan filled with carbonated water. Let them sit until the bubbles have completely gone flat. The steel will shine as good as new once removed and wiped down. Add witch hazel to the water fill in your iron, and as you're ironing, your clothes, instead of the stale smell normally produced, you'll have a sweeter, fresher scent instead. Within the difficult corners of furniture, where a vacuum cleaner's suction can't quite reach, use a paintbrush to easily reach the buildup that has escaped the suction for so long. Chewing gum stuck on your finger? Or maybe after popping it, is now stuck in your hair? Rub vegetable oil on it. Then leave it for a few minutes until you're able to remove it easily. Ammonia is 100% safe for the environment, though it can be harmful to the skin. But its cleaning uses are extensive. Pour a cup of household ammonia into a small bowl in the oven, making sure the oven is off, and leave it overnight. The next morning, wipe it down with a damp wipe. You'll appreciate the difference as you easily clean the grime from the hardest places to wash. Ammonia's natural benefits should mean it's always used instead of bleach. In the bathroom, not only does it make the tile sparkle like brand new, but it will easily remove mildew. One quarter cup of ammonia per gallon will get the job done. Running half a lemon down the side of a cheese grater will effectively remove sticky food particles. Just remember to wash with water afterward. This ensures a more effective cleanse and keeps your fingers safe from being cut. Make sure to save the juice from the lemon, as it's a natural substitute for bleach. Using just one half cup of juice per gallon, leave clothes to soak for at least an hour and then dry them out in the sun. The same volume can be used in a washing machine to brighten colors and bleach your whites. It's also possible to sanitize your earrings with one tablespoon of lemon juice in one and a half cups of water. Just be sure to avoid putting your gold and pearls, as they're sensitive to the acids found in lemons. Apply olive oil and a bit of salt when washing your cast iron pans after cooking. This will ensure you remove all the debris and will reduce the effects on the surface of the pan, extending its usage. Without using salt, the same method can be used to remove stains on stainless steel benches and ovens. Gently cleaning with a small amount of olive oil in a circular motion will not only remove charred fragments, but will also restore their shine. Due to the antimicrobial properties that olive oil contains, it's an incredibly safe and natural alternative to chemicals. Further varieties of oils, like tea tree oil, have even more benefits with their antiviral and antifungal properties. By using distilled oil in a spray bottle with a few drops of olive oil, you can make your own ready